Okay, um, so let's start here. Good morning to those of you who are in the Americas, um, but also good afternoon and good evening to those who are joining us from Europe, Africa, and Asia. Um, my name is Manjiri Mahajan. I am Associate Professor for International Affairs and co-director of the India-China Institute at the New School in New York. Um, I'll be the moderator of our panel today, which is on the topic of um, politics of gender in work and innovation in India and China. Um, we are very pleased to have with us today, Professor Ige Dong and Professor Lily Irani. Um, and we also are very lucky to have New School's Professor Ying Chen, um, who will serve as the commentator. Um, let me take a minute to introduce our panelists. Um, so Professor Ige Dong is Assistant Professor of Sociology and Global Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Buffalo, SUNY. Her research interests include political economy, labor, gender relations, contentious politics, and comparative historical methods. Um, she holds a PhD in sociology from the Johns Hopkins University, an MA in social sciences from the University of Chicago, and a BA in social sciences from the University of Hong Kong. Um, before joining Buffalo, she was the Suzanne Wilson Barnett Chair in Contemporary China Studies and Assistant Professor in International Political Economy at the University of Puget Sound. Um, Professor Dong is working on a book project, The Fabric of Care, Women's Work and the Politics of Livelihood in a Chinese mill town, um, which examines the seven decade transformation of care politics among industrial workers as China has transitioned from a socialist state to a capitalist economy. Um, Professor Dong has received a number of awards and fellowships. I won't mention all of them, um, but they do include the Loose ACLS Program in China Studies Early Career Fellowship and the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship in Women's Studies. Um, she also serves on the editorial board of the Made in China Journal. Um, her, the title of her talk today will be From Milltown to iPhone City, Gender, Labor, and the Politics of Care in Industrial China. Um, after Professor Dong, we'll have Professor Lily Irani, who is Associate Professor of Communication, Science Studies, Computer Science, Critical Gender Studies, and Design Lab at UC San Diego. So there are lots of affiliations there. Um, she has a PhD in Informatics from UC Irvine and an MS and BS in Computer Science from Stanford University. Um, her research investigates the cultural politics of high-tech work practices with a focus on how actors produce innovation cultures. Her work has had a focus on the US and India. Um, she has drawn on her training as a computer scientist also to collaboratively design, build, and maintain software that intervenes, resists, or demonstrates alternatives to existing platforms. Um, at UCSD, she co-directs the Just Transitions Initiative and sits on the AI Now Academic Council. Um, she's part of the Editorial Collective of Public Culture and serves on many other editorial advisory boards. Um, Professor Irani is the author of two books, the first, Chasing Innovation, Making Entrepreneurial Citizens in Modern India, published by Princeton University in 2019. Um, and her talk today is drawn from the work for that book. Is the winner, that book is the winner of the 2020 International Communication Association Outstanding Book Award and also the 2019 Diana Forsyth Prize. Um, she has a second book, Redacted, which is co-authored with journalist Jesse Marks. Um, that reflects on surveillance and publicity, transparency and collective action, as well as organizations and accidents. Um, her talk today is titled Translating Jugard into Innovation. Um, so we are very pleased and honored to have both of you as our panelists. And after Professor Irani finishes her presentation, we will have Professor Ying Chen as the commentator um, professor Ying Chen is Assistant Professor of Economics here at the New School. Um, she holds a PhD in economics from UMass Amherst. Her work explores the contradictions within capitalism and how they exhibit themselves. Um, topics she has studied include economic development, labor, climate change, um, and she's always had a special focus on the global south. 
Um, so we are thrilled to have Professor Chen as the commentator. Um, before I turn it over to the speakers, I want to note that we'll take questions at the end after Professor Chen's comments. Um, please, the request for the audience is to please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, the chat forum will be unavailable to the audience. So thank you. And I'm now going to turn it over to EK. All right. Uh Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, uh, uh, Majari. And uh, let me start with uh, sharing my screen with you all. Uh, and uh, OK, can you all uh, see the full screen here? Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. so first, I just want to take the chance again to thank uh, the India China Institute at the New School for inviting me and for organizing this um, very exciting panel. And uh, for my co-panelist, uh, Dr. Irani and uh, uh, Dr. I, and the moderator, Dr. Mahanja, and uh, and I also look forward to uh, Professor Chen Ying's uh, discussion uh, with us. And uh, today, I, I tailored the title of the talk a little bit to fit uh, this panel uh, better. So the talk, uh, the title is From Milltown to iPhone City, Descaling and the Informalization of Labor in China's Industrial Transition. And uh, this presentation is actually based on my work in a book in progress uh, with the title, um, as Majari just mentioned, The Fabric of Care, Women's Work and the Politics of lab, uh, Livelihood in Industrial China. And that actually traces, uh, I've changed it a little bit. So it's now expanded from seven decades to actually a century long changing politics of women's work um, and social reproduction in this city called uh, Zhengzhou. Uh, I'll uh, introduce more about it, which is a major city in China's industrial uh, heartland. And in the past uh, uh, seven decades, uh, Zhengzhou has witnessed the rise and the fall of industrial socialism and then transformed from textile mill town to the world's largest iPhone manufacturing center. Uh, so Zhengzhou, uh, that's uh, where the yellow uh, spot highlights, is the capital of Henan province um, in central China. Henan is one of the largest agricultural provinces um, that uh, which has undergone very rapid urbanization just in the recent decades. And then uh, in the upper left corner is a picture I took in, in one of those old textile mill towns in Zhengzhou, which stopped running already, but all the retire retirees, um, uh, workers who used to work there, uh, are still living in this um, community. And uh, at the bottom uh, uh, right corner is a picture I took inside uh, one of Zhengzhou's Foxconn uh, plants. Uh, a few years ago, I did my ethnography inside this um, plant, uh, working as an assembly line worker there. And uh, in this presentation, I focus on just the, a very small aspect of the book. Uh, that is two major changes that happened hand in hand um, to the local workforce amid this uh, massive uh, industrial transformation, namely, de-skilling and the informalization of labor. Um, but what I offer here is a feminist political economy analysis uh, to explain these changes. In specific, I want to challenge this conventional storyline and ex explain why these changes happened from a lens of uh, social reproduction. Uh, so let me describe these changes first before I explain them. Um, in the state-owned textile mills under state socialism between the 50s and the early uh, 2010s, um, um, which had, um, there had, a, uh, on average, a workforce of about 100,000 workers um, and uh, more than 60% of the workers were female. And this is one, a picture showing Chairman Ma visiting uh, one of the mills uh, in the year 1960. And today, Fox, Fox complaints in Zhengzhou uh, had the workforce about 250,000 workers on average, and with the capacity of producing 5 million iPhones uh, per day. And, uh, but about only 30% of the workforce uh, was uh, female. And this is uh, Apple's current CEO, Tim Cook, visiting the plant a few years ago. And to zoom in on the labor system under socialism, 
for the uh, sixty percent of female workers, most of them were semi-skilled, uh, if you want, wish, um, semi-skilled uh, spinners and the weavers. Um, and for the male, uh, there's a bifurcation. Uh, some of them occupy the better paid cadre and the technician positions. Uh, some uh, occupy the lowest paid unskilled positions in the auxiliary uh, department supporting uh, weavers and the spinners work, like moving stuff for them, uploading, docking for them. Uh, in other words, um, on the one hand, gender division of labor based on their essentialist the cultural understanding of work persisted in this period, right? It's not uh, fully dismantled. But on the other hand, uh, female workers enjoy relatively high social and economic status in this system, especially compared to their uh, counterparts before 1949. Accordingly, uh, this production system uh, also featured high rates of female labor force participation. Um, and uh, also a, enjoy a very high level of formalization in the forms of permanent employment once you're in the system as a state worker. Uh, very rarely they can uh, fire you. And also workers enjoy high level of social reproductive provisions, including subsidized housing, healthcare, childcare, maternity leaves, and so on. So that's a way labor was being decommodified. Um, However, the industrial restructuring that took place in the 1990s brought this order to an end. Uh, well, most of the textile mills uh, either went bankrupt or significantly downsized. The result of such restructuring um, is a new labor system, which has become the infrastructure foundation for Foxconn to thrive uh, in Zhengzhou in the past decade. Uh, in today's iPhone uh, factories, about 30% of the workforce are female and 70% uh, or male. Uh, I kind of took this picture uh, while we were in the orientation uh, session uh, the first day uh, I was there. And uh, also um, among all the workers, 90% uh, are these uh, unskilled uh, assembly line workers coming from rural areas uh, within the same province, Henan. And, uh, uh, despite uh, they are actually given a formal labor contracts uh, abiding the national law that was being in, uh, revised a few years ago that you have to, for Foxconn type of private enterprises, you, you ha have to give them a formal labor law. Despite that, uh, workers actually prefer to work here in short terms. Uh, many have turned this manufacturing job uh, into a gig work. Um, so how do we explain these changes, de-skilling, and uh, this kind of very uh, ironic informalization, even if you know, there is a way for them to keep the contract they didn't, but they don't like it. So the conventional discourse um, would attribute such de-skilling and informalization to an arguable neoliberal term we're all familiar with, which privatized the state-owned enterprises and commodified the workforce by ending permanent uh, employment and pushing both labor and the services of social reproduction to the market. But I argue what's missing here is a feminist perspective to capture a crucial process in which the previous gendered socialist establishment, meaning the comprehensive provisions for workers' reproduction with an emphasis on women's maternal need, was turned on its own head, weaponized now as a justification that facilitated the dismantling of the old system of formal employment and that which has led to informalization. And moreover, this process in turn has conditioned the disproportionate descaling of women's labor. These are my big claims. Uh, so to elaborate it a bit, um, at the beginning of the industrial restructuring in the 90s, nationwide, the entire textile industry became the first, very first sector in China to be put on the chopping board. And textile enterprises and workers were pressured to rely on themselves to survive. Now the state, right? Um, will not take care of you anymore. The rationale for the state to do so was that, oh, because textile industry is dominated by female workers, uh, it has the heaviest uh, social reproductive burden among all sectors. 
and thus it's the most vulnerable to the uh, market economy of fierce competition. So it has to go first. Uh, so this is um, Premier Zhu Rongji in 1998 famously said, enterprises sh shall not be in charge of organizing social life, um, which is uh, about her, right? Compared to what they were trying to do in the social period. As a result, massive layoff started from the textile, se textile sector. Many workers had to look for opportunities in other sectors. And here came the gendered uh, bifurcation of the workforce in terms of skills. For most of women workers uh, who were frontline weavers and uh, spinners, um, before the restructuring, they were placed right in the upper middle strata in terms of skill and uh, status. And paradoxically, precisely because of their specialization in weaving and spinning, which was very, very closely tied to what type of the machine they were using, um, their experience and the skills were really hard to be transferred to another sector. So it's hard for them to find a job in a different uh, manufacturing sector. Um, in contrast, the men who worked as technicians who uh, who were responsible to fixing the machine, that kind of skill is more portable. So they could uh, comparatively easily transfer their skill to a different sector. Many went to uh, the coastal area to find a job in the private um, sector. Well, and meanwhile, to quote unquote help these laid off workers, the local government start an initiative to train manufacturing workers to become service workers based on the perceived gender stereotype uh, in their mind, which did not really reflect the gender division of labor on the ground, but it's something, right, the government thought that's what women should do. So this is an example uh, from a different province, though, in which the local government was training the layoff female workers to be care workers, uh, especially for babies, taking care of babies. And I have an article from Spinners to Sitters that focus on this issue uh, in Zhengzhou, uh, the same thing happened. The Zhengzhou textile workers, Spinners, now uh, uh, like were actually many of them are uh, babysitters. Um, so in the end, many layoff women workers uh, end up being domestic uh, helpers and babysitters and unskilled male workers became safeguards and the janitors while the more skilled ones uh, could find a better job. While these, these uh, essential works, um, especially care work, definitely require highly uh, skilled, uh, highly specialized skills, they are not culturally perceived this way. At the societal level, they are all deemed as feminine. No matter it's a man's janitor's job or a women's nanny's job, they're, they're all feminized um, culturally and continue to be associated with low skill and precarity. Such a gender process of de-skilling has in turn further reinforced formalization, uh, informalization. So they really go, the two processes go hand in hand. And there are two channels uh, to consider. First, um, because of the existence of a large supply of relatively cheap but high quality care workers, middle class families in China can afford to uh, outsource their own social reproductive uh, need uh, to those, you know, um, cheap, relatively cheap labor. Hence, there's little demand from the middle class to re-estate uh, the state policies that used to provision care service, right? Um, and uh, so second, because the market can suffice. Uh, second, in today's manufacturing sectors, such as Foxconn, uh, as rural women with children are deemed as the least skilled, they are assigned to the most replaceable assembly line jobs with no career prospects whatsoever. Um, this has made them turn their jobs a de facto seasonal one. So they come to work <clears throat> in the city uh, in the peak season uh, for uh, overtime extra payment. Uh, so the peak season when, you know, iPhone is kind of under pressure, uh, Apple is under pressure to produce a lot before the September uh, season for, you know, release of the new product, uh, they can all go, uh, you know, overtime so that it can make it more. But then uh, after the peak season, they just go back to their villages uh, because there they have to 
continue to take care of the young and the elderly. As such a highly precarious labor system works for the interest of capital for sure. And there, so there's no incentive for capital to, to abide the labor law that promotes formality and modest welfare provision on paper. Uh, the, the, real, the, compl the, the real mechanism is more complex than that. I'm ha happy to explain more uh, in the Q&A. So finally, let me just end uh, by sharing a quote from one of my coworkers in the iPhone factory where I did my ethnography. Uh, this informant uh, is a woman at um, her thir 30s and she two, has two sons. One is uh, six and the other three. I blurred her uh, picture so uh, to keep a kind of a anonymity. anonymity. Um, and so she, when I asked her why you came to work here and she told me, um, summer is the best time because when my children do not have to go to school in the township, then I do not have to cook and watch them finish in homework every day. I can just leave them to their parents and come over here to work to bring in some extra cash. Um, when school starts in the fall, I'll have to go back uh, for sure. And uh, that's very true because now in, uh, remember I mentioned that even it's an agricultural province, but actually um, it's urbanizing at a really fast rate. So the living cost, uh, the, uh, the cost, uh, the standard living uh, has really uh, increased. Uh, and uh, you have to, being a rural resident, you also have to actually buy an apartment in the county seat um, for your, Sons, when they get married, they need to pay this bride price in the forms of apartment uh, or uh, and a vehicle. Um, and by farming, they cannot, you know, make enough. So even uh, for women, some extra money seasonally adding to the family would be something actually essential. And um, so in general, it's actually a complicity between the state capital and this new um, structure of social reproduction that has co-produced this paradox that, that they, they be, turn this, women turn this kind of job, a manufacturing job into a, a gig work. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm about to end here uh, and uh, I look forward to your uh, questions. And uh, um, I have another forthcoming paper on the story of Foxconn and uh, uh, please stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ige. That was a really fascinating talk and I can imagine how much we'll have in the Q&A section. Um, it actually reminded me of a story from India where a mill town, which is actually my town, Mumbai, um, you know, where the mills all get shut down. And I think Kaushik Sundarajan, but not just Kaushik, many others write about how the shutting down of these textile mills leads to the, you know, refashioning and extracting of labor in completely new forms in a global economy. In his case, it's a story of clinical trials and biocapital. In your case, it's a different kind of story. Uh, but, but I won't go into that right now. I'm, you know, keen to hand it over to Lily. Um, who will go next? Yeah, um, I also just want to thank you so much for that really exciting, it's like 15 minutes, but there, it had such depth and it actually reminds me a lot of um, when we talk about platform gig work, I've spent a lot of time researching online uh, data processing gig workers and working with them and sort of this framework you set up of the state, um, the industrial industrial owners and social reproduction structures creating the gigification. That's very powerful and should have a big impact in digital studies, so thank you. Um, so today I also tailor the title of my talk a bit, so let me get my screen sharing going. And um, my talk it will be titled Design and the Commodification of Social Reproduction, um, the translation of Jugad into innovation still plays a role, uh, but I wanted to highlight design as a kind of um, officialized, an, an officialized and professionalized way of recognizing the value of putatively creative work within um, an economy in India that and globally that wants to recognize kind of knowledge economies and intellectual property production. Um, within an economy also still very dependent on manufacture and extraction. So um, 
to begin, uh, the overview of this talk, which I should start with a timer, um, is uh, you know, first I'm going to talk about why did design grow in prominence as a form of expertise in India uh, during the time of my field work. Um, and then I'll talk about the design, uh, you know, not the way we usually hear about it through um, Apple or material culture studies, but I'm going to talk about design as uh, the work practices that I studied, which was um, professional workers searching for what I call what they call opportunities uh, in everyday life. And then I'll discuss in contrast to the kinds of creativity that designers find and want to build upon in everyday life, I'll contrast that with uh, proper designs that are scaled and branded. And I'll conclude by summing up the way that design is a search for exchange value that also is displacing use values. Um, so just to kind of describe kind of the stance I have on um, the kind of labor of everyday life is that, you know, in discourses of design and innovation, which is a lot of what my book overall studies, and this is drawn from you know, a couple of pages on my book that really focus in on gender. So I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, I see creativity as a kind of um, ongoing and everyday practice. And then um, all, only some of it comes to be recognized, valued and supported as design or as innovation um, you know, in work practices and also in policy. So why did design grow in prominence as a form of expertise um, here in India, which is the case that I'm focusing on? So uh, this is a very quick summary of what's an entire chapter in my book. Um, and in my book, I focus more on innovation. But with liberalization, first, um, domestic producers in India who had been largely uh, you know, family, you know, often family owned firms or sometimes state firms that were regulated through uh, what was the, you know, the, called the licensed import Raj. These domestic producers were exposed to competition for, for customers in some sectors. So even though there had been design schools in India since the 1950s, uh, with liberalization and awareness of design as a profession that can kind of embed marketing into products and um, guide, guide product producers you know, in a competitive marketing landscape, it became started to become more important. Um, the, during the time in my field work, which was largely 2009 through 2015, uh, transnational capital was also searching for what they called emerging markets in places like Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And um, these kind of the corporations, um, you know, like Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, pharmaceutical companies, technology companies, um, they were looking for ways of taking their existing manufacturing capacity, what they knew how to make, and repackaging them and marketing them and in placing them in India specifically. And so design was a profession that could help translate this marketing at the level of uh, the design of the products themselves and the pricing schemes. And so I ended up studying a number of projects that, you know, the weather through new product design or corporate social responsibility projects were trying to do this kind of work. Um, and a third reason why design grew in prominence as a form of expertise during the time of my field work was the growth of philanthropic capitalist forms of development. Um, philanthropic capitalism being the idea that you can uh, do, develop, do development or recognizably um, legitimate, socially good, uh, forms of work, but while also making a profit. And so these philanthropic capitalist forms of development, especially championed by Gates Foundation, by um, philanthropic endeavors of Citibank and others, they employed design to make interventions uh, both desirable and profitable. And, um, and actually, although it's not on this slide, within India, this was set in a larger context in which innovation had been growing, growing in importance as a policy priority. Um, in the book, I show how the five-year plans give more and more space to, quote, innovation as something that is added onto and extending science and technology policy. Um, and I argue that the growth of innovation as a priority is tied to the harmonization of India with global intellectual property orders um, 
which prioritize the needs of software industries globally and music industries globally, but especially in the United States and start to privilege a narrow sector of capital in India, especially software companies. Um, and so with this change in the political economy came a kind of growing discourse that innovation is a good thing and innovation is more than just patent and IP production, but it was a broader set of careers that included design um, because it allowed for the creation of investable vehicles of opportunity, new product lines, rather than say the more efficient production of existing products that address needs, social needs. So um, in this, so within this context, within this kind of both political economy and the kind of shifting discourses that value certain, newly value certain professions, including design, uh, I want to talk about the search for design as a search for opportunities to uh, make create exchange value out of everyday life. And so this is a vignette drawn from the 12 months of field work that I did with a studio called Dev Design. Um, Dev Design is a studio in Delhi, and they also had office in another city. Um, the designers who worked there were trained in the United States. Sorry. It's very early in the morning for me. The designers that were actually trained, um, born and raised and trained in India. Uh, many of them trained in uh, arts, design or business and engineering. And they had started this design firm as a way of contributing to what they felt was a more kind of personally authentic and uh, nation building form of uh, professional work after they'd had jobs in multinational consumer companies um, and, and you know, felt frustrated with the kinds of work that was allocated to, for them to do translating corporations um, into corporations um, into like Indian kind of into Indian distribution and marketing opportunities. So they started this firm called Dev Design, and in the pro and the project that I'm looking, you know, I'm going to share with you, uh, Dev Design was working for an American NGO, it's a large health NGO, and that NGO had funding from a philanthropic capitalist foundation to um, to design water filters that would produce what was, what was called in the project clean water, um, but was really about bacterial filtering, bacterially uh, filtering water filters. Uh, so the dev design staff uh, went to Andhra Pradesh and they studied a number of villages over the course of a four month study to figure out, okay, what are the ways that people handle water? What are the ways that they keep water in their homes? What are the ways they send water out with their kids? What are the everyday practices of water use, gathering and storage? so that the water filter that this NGO designs can fit into those practices of everyday life. And then also what are people's attitudes about what constitutes clean and safe water so that the filter can be articulated to those needs. And um, I write about it in the book, but I won't talk about it today. But they actually find that safe water for the people in the village that they were studying actually meant water without fluoride in it rather than water without bacteria. And then there's a whole problem of how the designers need to work around the fact that their funder's version of clean water is not the same as the, um, the version of clean water that the people in the villages that they would like, they're supposed to serve want. But for you know, but where they also take that kind of disconnect between the social need and um, what their funder wants to manufacture and distribute bacterial water filters is the designers go and look for okay, well, what do the people actually? What do the people we're studying? What is it that they do want? And so they undertake you know forms of kind of applied anthropology and field work. They look at homes, they interview people, and one day they find a kind of clue in this puzzle of what it is that people want. And that, so the puzzle is here on the picture on the right. A clay vessel and a plastic water bottle filled with water sat by a pipe covered in a wet cloth. So Shmita, who lived in the house, had draped the soaked towel and suspended the vessel, effectively creating an evaporative refrigerator with the items already available to her. Uh, these wrapped vessels were an evaporative cooling system. As water evaporates from the surface of the vessel, it also draws heat away from the contents. An American development consultant on the project excitedly explained, oh, what they really want is cold water and consistent access. 
In the weeks that followed, the designers and the NGO seized upon this as a sign of latent need, what professional designers called a workaround. Workarounds were taken to be temporary fixes to be addressed by a proper innovation. So the term workaround is actually found in the professional design literature taught in business schools and design programs. Um, and one example is the book Thoughtless Act pictured on the right by uh, anthropologist Jane Fulton Suri of the global but based in Palo Alto design firm IDEO. Um, IDEO is an influential broker and evangelist of design expertise globally. So the workaround um, is also linked to concepts like thoughtless acts in this book and um, phrases like automatic, you know, story writes, we interact automatically with objects and spaces that we encounter. So the workaround is a kind of thoughtless and automatic act of interacting in everyday life with the materials that you find around you to fashion your survival or to fashion the ongoing con continuation of your activities. This discourse of thoughtlessness and automaticity also transposes older British colonial discourses documented by Anandam Dutta that saw artisans in India uh, as, quote, tradition bound, corporeally productive, but conceptually blind. This discourse of uh, workarounds and thoughtlessness that are in need of legitimate design interventions to insert properly designed products into everyday life uh, also kind of echoed, although is not completely commensurate, with a Hindi concept called Jugad. Uh, during the time of my field work, Indian middle classes <clears throat> talked about Jugad solutions as clever improvisations that achieved a goal in tightly constrained situations. So on the left, we have an ex one example of this discourse. As the Indian press debated Indians' capacities to innovate, uh, some commentators marshaled jury rigged devices such as bullock carts propelled by diesel irrigation pumps as evidence of a recognizably Indian form of innovation. And critics of Jugad countered that it stood for shoddy quality, short term thinking, and had hobbled India's development. In India's business line, the article pictured here, or somebody who identifies themselves as a strategy and innovation consultant wrote that Jugad has no, I quote, design element or risk-taking. It is not born of research or from technical mastery, from identifying lacuna in the customer needs or a eureka moment in the laboratory. Critics paint Jugad as a form of situational reason, tempor temporally and spatially particular, developed in the heat of the moment and constrained by the rigors of necessity or majburi. In this frame, Jugad mostly reproduces the status quo while finding niches of survival within it, producing use value out of waste and surplus, but not exchange value. And so one of the things I want us to think about and what remains in the next example I'm gonna give in my talk is what are the, what is the, what are the gender, what's the gender of the people who are able to take that distance design element and risk taking? That isn't born of the moment, um, you know. And also, we could ask, like, what you know, what are the caste and class statuses of the people that are able to do that? So, by contrast to Sushmita's cooling vessels, this man's cooling vessel on the left, Prajapati's, made him into a hero. The Miti Cool Prajapati's invention works on the same principle as Sushmita's cooling vessel, and so that's the invention that I have pictured on the right. But this cooling vessel is one of the rural innovations celebrated by a business school professor in India, Anil Gupta, a proper reproduced and scalable design. So what this is, is a clay refrigerator. Um, food and items that you want cooled go into the cabinet that has a door uh, and you pour water into the refrigerator so it sits in the kind of inner walls of the refrigerator and as the water evaporates out of the clay surfaces by the same kind of mechanism, the heat is drawn away. So uh, University of Iowa scholar Prashant Rajan has conducted life histories of Prajapati along with other rural innovators. And in what follows, I'm very reliant on the valuable work that he's done. The rural innovators that are profiled and recognized as rural innovators by the Indian government and in Prajapati's research are almost all men. And uh, Rajan's work illustrates the kind of support required to enable rural innovators like Prajapati 
<clears throat> to develop recognizably scalable innovations. Project Prajapati, uh, the inventor of the Minty Cool, forged a relationship, for example, with a middle class invest investor in a factory that in which he was a pottery laborer. Others rely on the salaries of day labor wages of other family members. Um, some find wealthier patrons who are willing to invest in taking their um, kind of acts of creativity and making them branded and scalable and manufacturable. Other inventors that are profiled uh, um, in Rajan's work, own land. Gupta, Rajan, and others actually argue that much rural innovation is developed through collective development, use, feedback, and refinement rather, the, rather than the proverbial individualized perspiration and inspiration that leads to uh, acts of intellectual property authorship. And yet, even in these projects that attempt to locate innovators like Prajapati, who create inventions collaboratively in their local milieus, families, and among their neighbors, even those projects locate and lionize innovators that are individuated and reproduce the masculine entrepreneur who speaks for the distributed creativity that they have worked to scale up and make branded and recognizable. So, <clears throat> But the labor of invention requires the labor of keeping life going. And these were the labors that were written out of profiles like the profile uh, on the left that's celebrating Prajapati's Mitipur refrigerator. These were the labors written out of the innovation awards that the Indian government gave to rural innovators. And these are the labors that were written out of invention patents and most histories of invention. So I wanna, <clears throat> so I wanna read each of the case studies that Rajan has produced of rural innovators against the grain to find stories of resources and sustained innovators as they work to make something scalable and reproducible. So these stories came from wives who had salaries as teachers, sorry, the resources came from wives who had salaries as teachers that supported the time the men and their families were taking off to make these branded and scalable innovations. The resources came from farmland and farm workers who cultivated the crops that fed the inventor directly or indirectly. The resources sometimes came from family members who could invest money. So seen one way, the ability for these recognizable designers or innovators to work for free um, to elaborate a recognizable invention required significant privilege or significant subsidy or both. And some of the family members Rajan profiled also saw it another way. The inventive and designing efforts of some in their family put pressure on others in the family, usually women, to scramble, borrow, and to make up earning shortfalls while the inventor that they were subsidizing was out of the workforce. So the risks taken by innovators and the risks taken in the celebration of a form of design that is about doing free and inventive labor can intensify what Megan Moody calls the peril of families and communities making up for the loss of predictable wages of the organized sector or even the daily informal income people make in the need economy. So in conclusion, seen from the perspective of such household creativities, we see the design attempts to transform use values in everyday life, including the use values of social, re social reproduction into opportunities for companies to make exchange value or profit. The construction of what is proper design and what is considered jugad or a workaround was a practice of recognition, contingently situated in improvisational interaction, but conditioned by class, caste, and gender, as well as nation building projects and histories that I brought more broadly document in my book. In the political economy of Indian development, design served as a way of searching for exchange value that can convert existing manufacturing capacities and knowledge into into products that would be desirable and profitable for as new markets and even better if it could be claimed as a form of development registering in statistics as economic growth which i argue is uh, registered as exchange value at the time of my field work in india um so uh, yeah i'll conclude with that and leave it to discussion thank you so much <laughs> Thank you very much, Lily. Um, so we should now go to Ying um, for comments. Thank you. 
thank you to uh, both scholars uh, for your fascinating work, first of all, and your uh, great presentation of your work in uh, such a short time. Uh, I learned a lot by reading uh, uh, both scholars' work. Uh, as a political economist by training, I found it really interesting uh, when I read the uh, when I read uh, both of them, uh, the, the work of both scholars, uh, to see their special focus on the care sector and the technological uh, arena, uh, which helped me to also um, understand the big political economy change and the changes in basically the way how economy is organized, how society is organized uh, in a much more comprehensive way. So my comments would also be uh, along those lines, trying to make connections uh, between the works by uh, Igu and Lily and some of the uh, literature on political economy and development that I am also more familiar with. Um, so, uh, uh, on uh, Igo's work, a particular point that really uh, caught my attention, really also struck me as ironic, as, as Igo mentioned, was that when privatization hit, uh, the textile industry was the first target uh, and was precisely because uh, previously uh, the, under the socialist operation, the workforce uh, in the textile industry was primarily women and, and Igo showed with her uh, field work that actually those women were able to uh, be engaged with semi-skilled work and therefore they actually have a relatively good or even higher social status compared to their uh, some of their male uh, counterparts. So that was actually a very ironic thing when this kind of gendered arrangement later, uh, as Igor said, was turned on its own head and was weaponized as the justification for dismantling the old system of formal employment. So. I, I see here this complete turn of economic logic uh, here. Previously, under the socialist arrangement, the priority was more for workers to be employed, to feel at home uh, when they are at work. Uh, so all the facilities that are on site in the factory, uh, you know, I mean, childcare, schools, sometimes library, I, I know sometimes, you know, you have factory music band right was designed to be there uh, to achieve that kind of social function but after the privatization after the entire economic logic was shifted more to a you know uh, profit oriented cost efficiency kind of imperative uh, those activities were all considered as unproductive those investments were considered as unproductive and so they should all go because they don't bring bring in tangible profits anymore. Uh, so I I mean, I, I'm, I am more familiar with this kind of narrative, but I think uh, what, uh, what uh, Igor just showed us was a very, very specific, very detailed story of how particularly this gendered uh, narrative was, um, this gendered arrangement was actually being taken advantage of, right, in, in this kind of overall political uh, economy change. So I really find that striking, uh, strikingly important. Um, so um, another thing I, I found uh, interesting that caught my uh, attention uh, was that uh, the, the overall uh, under uh, definition of formal employment is also seems like uh, seems like is undergoing some changes. So when Igor showed in the slides, uh, formal employment before. Uh, includes not only the job security, job tenure, but also social reproductive pr uh, provisions. Uh, but in today's world, even formal employment does, I mean, doesn't include social reproductive pr provisions in that full package anymore. I mean, we probably have uh, matern matern maternal leave still, but in terms of providing daycare uh, or, or, you know, a, a little bit more compared to the socialist period, th those things are also gone in that sense, right? So in that sense, there is also some kind of informalization of the formal sector as well that we are seeing today. So the line between formal and informal employment is also starting to become more and more blurry. Uh, to the direction that uh, I feel like in, informalization is the general trend. Uh, 
So that's something that I uh, was thinking when I was reading, and probably Igor can also talk a little bit uh, what, what you find uh, during the during the field work. Um, another thing I found interesting was that um, the, the the understanding of, of skill. I think this also go uh, connects with what Lily was talking about in her, in her in her work about what is considered as invention, what is considered as innovation, right? Um, babysitter, for example, when when the spinners weavers later uh, were de-skilled and have uh, no not much choice, and some of them decided to go to do care care work and babysitter, and particularly. Uh, uh, the maternity caretaker. Uh, I, I found it interesting also that um, I know in some places, I, I, you could also mention this, in some places uh, where USA, basically the women who take care of uh, new moms in their one month, one month after they gave birth, um, was paid particularly high uh, wage, high, high salary. And uh, in, in, in some sense, it, it shows the recognition of that special skill, but in, in but in most ca uh, cases, in, in the mainstream understanding, that skill, that that babysitter skill, that care skill, is not really a skill. So so in that sense, how do we really define skill? Right? What is considered as skill uh, is the caretaking, the babysitter skill, also a skill or not? Right? I mean, I think there is also some kind of political economy. Um, logic behind as well. So maybe Igor can also talk a little bit about that. And maybe Lily would also comment on that. Um, the, the last comment on uh, Igor's work and also something that I would like to he hear uh, her um, talk about is uh, this idea of uh, gig economy and platform economies um, in the context of China, but compare it to uh, what is going on in, in the global north and in the United States and in West particularly, uh, where in the beginning, I, I think we also hear a lot of the narratives that focuses on only the merit side of the, of the gig economy, uh, the informal sector, for example, that they're very flexible, they provide some kind of autonomy to the people who are doing informal works. They can decide when they can do it, when they don't want to do it. They can decide to do it when they are short on cash. Um, but later we started to see, especially in places like Uber, uh, we started to see you know, that, that, that people are driven by a plant economy uh, uh, and, and was basically subjected into more like heavier exploitation because you know, they cannot take a break in the middle. They were basically con con controlled by the AI algorithm. So, so in that sense, that kind of sense of autonomy was uh, uh, got lost uh, throughout this process. And also with the overall shrinking size of the formal uh, sector in, in, the, in the West, right? In the United States and, and the West uh, and Europe. Europe. So I, I wonder what you would think about um, this discussion in the context of China, because uh, right now in the examples that we are seeing, uh, some women appreciate this kind of autonomy. They appreciate this kind of flexibility because they have other things they want to they want to do and they want to be with their kids. They want to be with their uh, elderly to help out and all that. So they appreciate this kind of flexibility. So so what, what would you think about, in that sense, the long trend of it? Do we see this kind of flexibility and autonomy conditions would also deteriorate over the time? Or do you think that uh, this is perhaps a very unique feature uh, of the case that we are focusing here? So the kind of benefits of staying in the informal service sector for these women would, uh, would, would stay long, would stay more permanent. So I want to hear uh, your thoughts on that. Um, then um, let me turn to uh, Lily's work and just to say that I find it really interesting uh, when you trace the history of how innovation is understood uh, in India. You talked about how during the first five year plans, 
how innovation was defined, how invention was defined, and traced it through the whole development trajectory and showed us little by little until now that innovation is completely linked to intellectual property and things that you could attach basically a market price, a market tag on it. Um, and th this also reminds me, when I was reading it, reminds me of a paper uh, written by a new school alum, uh, actually, who, who is now teaching in, in UK, who was uh, trying to study how international agency, international statistics agency, have been revi revising their GDP measurement to include things that were once excluded. So for example, R&D, right, research and development, um, artistic originals of entertainment, and also weapon systems. So those things both previously were considered as only intermediate inputs. So they were not really considered as value added, but now it is, it was considered as investment, right? So they now have market value. Uh, so, so I think this really was happening uh, consistently, right, under the same kind of trajectory where we see uh, more and more equating between uh, development and GDP growth and development with income per capita growth, right, where, where development was also, in a way, narrowly understood as uh, uh, GDP growth and GDP was narrowly understood as just, you know, things with market values that are uh, uh, booming right in the in the economy, so I found it uh, really interesting that kind of alignment. Um, I also find it very uh, interesting to to see that uh, this national discourse to encourage entrepreneurship, to encourage invention, uh, particularly among the poor, coincide with this overall neoliberal prescription for development. And, and this is very typical, uh, probably particularly uh, obvious in the example of microfinance, where you know the, the, the idea is that we're going to provide a little bit of credit to people, to, to poor people, but eventually they need to figure out a way to become an entrepreneur, to start their own business, so that they compete, right? They compete in the market economy. They still engage with the capitalist logic of organizing the economy and then we praise the winners and we just don't talk about the talk talk about those who lose from the competition and we highlight it as a solution to development right so i found it's also very interesting that this kind of uh, overall development narrative is also uh, shown in the in uh, manifested in the indian context particularly on this technological invention um uh, uh, arena the last point i want to make uh is that i really appreciate that you were using the political economy framework to talk about the overall changes that you're rec recording here which is basically the shift from prioritizing use value to prioritizing exchange value and you also use other terms like valorization of innovation, right? How how does innovation get valorized, get recognized at all? Do they get valorized and recognized at all? Was very much, as you argued, conditioned by class, caste, gender, and economic development regime. So I found it really interesting, very profound um, um, insight on that. Um, it, so it, it follows that one may draw at least two possible implications from it. Uh, the first would be that, okay, to solve this problem, uh, we should maybe acknowledge these very important but uncompensated indigenous innovations, monetary compensation, valorize it, give it a market label, right? Or the second one is more of uh, let's shift to a social relations of production where we actually prioritize use value. Um, so that, you know, we, we are not just trying to bring everything unpaid and uncompensated into the market into the market arena uh, as a whole and consider it done, but but more to think about, you know, what what is the way to bring out the, the social value as the primary imperative for production and distribution. 
So I think this reminds me of the debate also in the feminist literature on how do we address this unpaid care labor issue, right? So there are also different school of thoughts. One would think that, okay, we should uh, commodify it, right? We should compensate it. We should pay wages to those un un unpaid uh, work. Uh, or the other would say that, well, then we are just subject these unpaid um, care workers to another layer of exploitation, because if we bring it, them to the market exchange, then there's surplus value that's going to be extracted as well, right? So in that sense, uh, there are different ways, uh, although based on the same observation, also although the critique is very similar, the conclusion, the, the solutions offered sometimes vary. So I would also like to hear your thoughts on debate like this, um, but maybe in the context of the indigenous innovations that you're uh, that you are focusing on in your work. Okay, thank you. That's my comments and questions. Thank you very much, Jing. Um, you know, thank you for your very thoughtful comments for two really excellent um, talks. So maybe I'll first turn back to the panelists, Ige and Lily, and give you a chance to address um, some of Ying's questions, um, and then we'll start taking questions that are in the Q&A box. But, but Ige, do you want to go first? Okay, uh, sure, Amajari. Um, um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ying, for your very, very thought-provoking questions and comments, uh, very, you know, spot on. And uh, I will try to answer them, uh, you know, uh, in the expressed way, I guess, but we can keep the conversation going after this. Um, very good questions. So first, I'm very glad you, you told me that, right, this so-called gender story of political economy is something uh, that strikes. And uh, that's precisely one of my purpose, right? The, my, the kind of a feminist political economy agenda is to show uh, that uh, gender is not just a add on element. like, okay, where are women? We should care about them. All those layoff women workers are the worst. Yes, that's important. But what's the analytical purchase here, right? By adding gender, it's a built in element in the political economy. It's just the uh, earlier, you know, hegemonic version of the conventional version of that is gender blind to masculine so that they forget about social reproduction. They forget about this gender dynamic. So their picture is not even complete, right? So without having gender perspectives here, we don't even have a correct version or a more in-depth version, right, to understand this very, very um, complex uh, pro process of China or, um, you know, China's um, industrial uh, re restructuring or the similar pro processes in other places. So thanks for giving me a chance to say it aloud. And second, um, uh, uh, um, relative to this point, right, uh, like you, you're, you're very, um, you know, um, are sharp uh, by being, uh, uh, being, you know, recognizing that when we talk about formal employment, right, formalization, uh, it seems like the substance of formal has also changed. And uh, one reason is because when labor scholars are talking about, you know, precarity, right, um, like guy standing or, you know, there are a long list of them, um, they define formal, and uh, well, they in, yes, they define formal employment uh, as uh, permanent or stable, you know, stable job with security and actually with benefits. So benefits is part of this package of uh, formality, including pension, healthcare. Uh, many people are now put in this so-called um, job lock or or um, benefit lock. So they work not because they want to work in this particular sector, they work for their pension and the uh, healthcare benefit. Um, but that is a very narrow definition of security or formality because that comes from a background history of welfare, capitalist welfare state in which they define what is benefit, what is security, what is um, welfare, pension and uh, Healthcare, basically, it's been you know um, the for the you know for the for for this you know uh, work regime, but that's the capitalist version of it. But in the socialist version of it, right, uh, we have a broader idea about what is um, you know should be formalized or decommodified, which is more expensive or extensive, including childcare 
on-site daycare centers, as you mentioned, on-site healthcare clinics in the factory, so on and so forth, and even you know a free school education for the second generation of the workers. That's the socialist version, a socialist uh, vision about you know what is a secure and a for formal job. So I, I'm glad you brought it up, so we can see as actually here what I'm trying to propose is maybe social reproduction is a more all-encompassing a more comprehensive concept, analytical concept than welfare um, to understand uh, right, the, the, the different variations of job formalization and the informalization. Uh, second, uh, third, um, I, I, I wanna also hear about you know, what Lily thinks of this, right? The, how to uh, valorize um, the skill. I, I think there's definitely this uh, gender logic underlying all this, like why, uh, care work, which is highly skilled, uh, is not deemed that way. I, that's why I think that's where uh, Marxist uh, political economy has a limit, uh, where you have to have feminist, uh, you know, cultural analysis uh, chime in, right, to see this kind of um, like very profound like cultural formation that valorize uh, labor that cannot actually be fully explained by the logic of capital accumulation because capital doesn't really care uh, gender race and it's um, you know a pre-existing cultural formation that intersects well at least that's my view that I know there are a lot of debates within the circle on that point um, and uh, uh, and but I think no matter how much skill it requires, right, uh, when it gets feminized, uh, right, um, uh, it will be devalued in our current uh, masculine economic system. Uh, there's actually a question in the Q&A related to that. I might uh, also can uh, address that later. And finally, your fourth question about gig economy in the comparative context. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I think the literature, uh, has done what you just said, right? It used to be more, you know, uh, positive, but now it's, of course, more critical about this, all this. And uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, if we think, uh, conceptualize, so what's, so when we think about gig economy, we're comparing this with some old uh, hegemonic model of work in the past. That's why we see novelty in this new form. The, the, the conventional model we're comparing with is this you know, post-war uh, Fordist um, model of industrial work regime, uh, which is highly, again, uh, you know, uh, racially biased, uh, you know, sexually biased. It's work around a uh, you know, ideal middle class, not middle class, but, you know, a uh, skilled uh, manufacturing white male worker who also has a family wage, right? Who can claim that you should pay uh, not just my single uh, wage, right? Uh, my paycheck should cover both me and the reproduction of my whole family. So that's the hegemonic model we're all comparing with. That's why we see uh, a lot of problems with the gig economy. Oh, suddenly we all lose the job security. We all lose, you know, the the, the, the union's power. But we should all right uh, be aware that that uh, model, old model per se, is uh, uh, rife with problems and and uh, limitations. But that so we so the point is we definitely should move away from it. But it's just that. The gig economy is not the direction we should go. So in terms of, instead of thinking about gig economy, uh, why don't we think about social economy where we don't have to report to work nine to five, five days a week, right? Work, industrial types of work really sucks, I, <laughs> right? We need flexible and autonomy, but, right? Can we actually detach ourselves from this, you know, a very oppressive, exploitative relation with capital? Can, can we do both? Why can't we? work, you know, in Marx's uh, vision, right, for our creativity uh, with a social wage, uh, which is not uh, embedded in a capitalist uh, relation. Well, that sounds very utopian, but I think, uh, so basically there should be a third way. It's not like you have to choose gig or, you know, old jobs. Uh, yeah, I'll end here first, yeah. Thank you very much, Ige. Um, Lily, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, so much to talk about there. Like there, you said it. <laughs> um, so yeah, there are a lot of 
really important things. So Ying, thank you for thinking through these talks so generously and making connections and it's definitely pushing my thinking forward. So um, I guess I'll start with a recognition of skill and this question of you know, what is defined as skill um, and maybe how to valorize it. So I am coming, um, I think I'm like a deep skill skeptic in the sense of like, I think there's like, there's like a STS definition of skill that's about the ability to regularly produce reliable effects. You know, that's kind of coming from studies of scientists and um, I think it's like Harry Collins has a book about like, what's expertise? Um, so, you know, but like this, we're not talking about nothing when we talk about skill. Um, but if if skill is valuable as a concept because it talks about the effect, the possibility of like reliably producing certain effects and the kinds of investment in of time in one's cultural uh, and ecological development in order to be in order to be able to do that, then you know, as a concrete example, and this is an example actually drawn from my other research, but it's really shaped my thinking of this. Um, you know, the gig workers who do data processing work. Uh, to train artificial intelligence on platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk, they have a generalized and very difficult to, in a way, to acquire skill of providing culturally competent linguistic and categorization um, of, you know, of the world. And that's what AI is really bad at. Like AI is not, you know, AI is a correlation machine. AI has to eat up all of our textual representations that we produce on the web to produce some simulacrum of small fragments of natural language. Um, you know, everything that AI knows how to do to identify um, whether it's, you know, a couch or a pedestrian in a self-driving car or a baby's butt in some future automated care technology. Like it has, there's a human who's acquired this cultural capacity who then has to train AI to simulate like a very narrow version of that skillful performance. So um, that kind of gets, so like then we have this, ver this kind of commonplace economics version of skill that's like, I to me is about kind of justifying through the fiction of um, scarcity or training that certain kinds of labor is valued more. <laughs> um, and so that's all kind of background. And, and, that, and that's not, you know, but like the actual skills that are needed by capital or needed by like say AI are not the skills that are rewarded or valorized within that kind of capitalist framework. So that sort of <laughs> is like the background assumption of some of the work that I did with this book. Um, another way that this came out in my field work, and this is more in a chapter on the design studio itself is, you know, there's like, I'm studying these like professional, like middle-class, like fluent in, you know, fluent in English um, designers working in Delhi. And, you know, they're like artists and have gone to engineering school. So they, so they have social capital, they have cultural capital, um, but, even they would kind of constantly be responding to changes in the market for their kind of expertise, expert consulting labor. So, you know, for a year, they're like a design firm and then they became an innovation and strategy firm. And, you know, the skills they would produce were sometimes just translating um, field work needs of global corporations and global design firms into kind of locally executable forms, but eventually they started competing with those global design firms and designing their research studies. Um, but sometimes, you know, they were also doing DJ work and starting restaurants and this kind of added to their aura of creativity that made them more hireable for these more narrow forms of design consulting labor. So there's this one quote where one of the women I worked with is like, okay, so like we're experts, but what are we experts of? <laughs> Um, and so I kind of concluded in, in my book that what is really being um, sold as this kind of design consulting labor is the ability to um, use a set of relationship, you know, use a set of relationships and kind of cultural assessments that do a kind of apply to anthropology to aid in corporate planning, um, rather than necessarily the kinds of skills one might be able to formally learn in any kind of classroom curriculum we could talk about. Um, so that's, um, those are just some, con you know, concrete kind of thoughts and, uh, examples of this problem of skill. And so I'm not sure I even care to, um, valorize skill. It's like, I care more to kind of deconstruct it and just provide for a kind of social economy. I think maybe along the lines Ike was also pushing us towards. Um, 
And then the question you asked me directly was, um, you know, how do you solve this, you know, how do we solve this problem about the kinds of um, practices of everyday life that are becoming commodified as innovation, you know, through design? Um, do we compensate all these unrecognized forms of collaboration and subsidy that allow for this? Or should we shift to kind of social relation of production where we prioritize use value? Um, so you know, I definitely lean towards the prioritization of use value rather than attempting to commodify every contribution uh, for two reasons. Um, I think one is that uh, a lot of what my book does is to kind of point to the politics of valorizing something as new. <laughs> um, you know, if it, there's this kind of everyday sense of like innovation creates new solutions. But then if you look at the actual political economy innovation of innovation, it's actually property regimes and also um, expertise regimes that privilege the needs of um, software and to some extent, some aspects of, you know, art and creative industries, like depending, uh, depending on well, which, polit which political economists are at the job. Um, and I argue that this recognition of new in another part of the chapter that um, Yingyi read also creates problems of, well, what kinds of um, cultural production is recognizable as, what kinds of cultural production is recognizable as new has everything to do with what you think somebody's tradition is and what you th what kind of attribution of skill or creativity like you as the one who's assessing that newness um, makes to them and so um, people so Jugad will not often be recognized as new because it's like putting together existing things in a context of scarcity for example from this talk um, the other reason that I'm skeptical about trying to valorize specific um specific components is because it's just the labor of auditing means the testing kinds of bean counting forms of labor and the actual concrete bureaucracies that, that would um recognize to implement um so but yeah that i think i i do think that providing compensation for aspects of production or I think the reconfiguration of production in India, for example, through the NREGA program, the National Rural Employment Guarantee, can actually be very powerful to tell people that you have access to 100 days of work when you want it, um, and that work cannot be for the kind of private agricultural like landowners in your town. Like I think that that can do very powerful things to reconfigure gender and caste relations, um, but I wouldn't do it through the lens of valorizing the new as innovation as a particular kind of thing. Um, one thing that I think could be interesting is, you know, if we think about how to support the production of use values and if, um, you know, technologies, whether they're mechanical or computational or chemical, such as in forms of, you know, like uh, cooking or cleaning or disinfecting, um, you know, if there are particular supports people could use to share knowledge to produce those use values, um, supporting those kinds of knowledge sharing or resource sharing, I think could be interesting. So outside of the realm of the news. So one example of this is this Professor Anil Gupta that I mentioned, who's been taken up as a celebrant of rural innovation. Um, he's a business school professor, but what he's actually been doing for 30 years, he has, he has a network called the Honeybee Network. And the Honeybee Network would take students and activists going from village to village every single year on yatras to like locate um, changes in the kinds of use value that are being produced in villages and then producing newsletters in multiple Indian languages that circulate knowledge about these um, practices in the villages with people in other villages. And so like the honeybee pollinates by moving across flowers. So that's a, you know, that, that is an example of supporting use value without necessarily restricting it to um, something that's recognizable as new innovation or high tech innovation or you know, other ways that we have of like sectioning off what kinds of use values we want to pr promote and commodify into exchange value. Um, and I've been talking a lot, so I can leave it there, but um, maybe just the last, uh, yeah, I think there's more to discuss. I'll leave it to the interaction. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. So I'm I'm good. I I think we should give some time for the audience. So I'll leave it to you, Majari. Thank you. Um, no, thank you very much, Ying, and thank you, Lily and Ige, for those um, answers. Um, you know, there are many questions in the Q and A box. I just want to jump to those, and I'll cluster a few. Um, so maybe the first set of questions, Ige, is for you by Chris. Um, who's asking who ended up supplying the textile market demand that these women no longer served. Um, I would love to hear more about this phenomenon that the women still live in the same neighborhoods despite not working in the factories of those places anymore. Um, how do the women's experiences in the textile factory continue to inform their roles as caretakers? I mean, it's a bunch of different questions. They echo some of the questions which come later in the Q&A, um, but maybe just you know, asking for a bit more thickness uh, of your ethno ethnographic work um, in these neighborhoods, in these factories, and the experiences of these women in particular. Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Majari, and thanks, um, Chris, for being a very diligent uh, uh, listener. And uh, um, good questions. So basically, um, it's because uh, uh, urban China has undergone this trans transformation from the old state, you know, uh, social system to the new one. So they replace all the old, uh, you know, uh, formal secure uh, higher paid workers with uh, migrant rural migrants who can put up with the worst uh, working condition and uh, who uh, kind of are like go back to their village to do their social reproduction. So for many, many years until recently, uh, being a mi migrant, right, rural migrant workers working in those textile mills in Zhengzhou were actually most of them, were, you know, were moved to the coastal specific econom uh, special economic zones uh, uh, under fully controlled by private capital, where working conditions were, were worse, uh, hours were extended from eight to 12, so on and so forth. Uh, they, they are the rural workers and because they just need more cash. Uh, that started, you know, uh, from the actually the 90s and uh, they were not, uh, they were denied access to urban welfare systems. Um, uh, like they could not claim pension, health care. Uh, they have to go back when they're old or injured. They just, you know, die in their own village that that's pretty sad and uh until recently uh the the, the state is trying to urbanize them and uh and uh, trying to tell them uh as long as you can work here in the city for 15 years uh no matter uh your household registration status you can claim you know benefit locally but who can work in the you know iPhone factory for 15 years, where there's no hope of, you know, uh, upward mobility. And then uh, it's actually, there are a lot of fascinating stories happening to the retirees, to, you know, those layoff workers who still live there, because uh, again, this is a socialist legacy. Um, the factory built, right, their uh, uh, housing, their apartments, and uh, they live there, they send their kids to the uh, school attached to the factory until, you know, it's privatized. Uh, it's a live, very lively uh, community. And uh, when I'm doing, uh, I was doing this ethnography, people would tell me, if you want to find the best street food, you want to find the best, you know, barber shop uh, in, you know, this uh, fastly, uh, quickly expanding metropolitan, you go to those old communities because communities, the fabric, right, of the old communities are still there. But I'm not trying to romantize it because, right, um, uh, they suffered a lot in this massive layoff process. Uh, many had to, like, if they could find a nanny's job or a janitor's job, they're the better off, right? Many uh, were, had even to go uh, even downward word uh, in terms of the social ladder uh there are a lot of you know sad stories like put, they put themselves in debt or even you know took their own lives uh if they couldn't really you know weather this uh, huge traumatic uh change but uh all the women i talk there are very lovely like they want to help me and uh they take my research series they want to share me all their uh stories the, so the book is more about those you know uh, life stories and uh yeah and finally, um, yes, so actually the argument of the, uh, uh, um, both the, from the state and those workers themselves is, for example, one uh, spinner turned sitter, right, told me that the why I'm the best, uh, she's called the golden medalist in the nanny's job, the postpartum care. Why I'm the best? Because uh, when I was a spinner, I work, you know, those night shifts. I can work from uh, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., 
uh, that's the same demand for uh, postpartum workers because you need to take care of the baby while the parents go to sleep. So she's like, well, when I'm young, I, I was doing this fine. So this is not big deal, but my body is my big investment or my big capital. If I some when they got sick, I cannot do it anymore. Um, and uh, so there's a definitely a logical connection that the, 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 the discipline, the body, they were trained that way and thus perceived, you know, uh, uh, dexterity, you know, uh, and also kind of a very um, careful, you know, um, mindset uh, were all become a justification that why they can compete with all compete to actually their rural uh, competitors. There are actually 90% of the Chinese uh, domestic helpers and nannies are actually from the rural area, but it's actually the urban ones that, you know, outperform uh, because of this legacy. Thank you, Ige. Um, so maybe a question, you know, there are many more questions than we can do justice to, unfortunately. So I do want to welcome the audience to email the speakers if we can't get to your question. But I wanted to um, take up a question that Sarah Parks asked Lily, which was, has there been any local social pushback to the devaluing of Jugar? But I also wanted to kind of throw in some questions which maybe pick up from the audience's questions, but also my own kind of interest where in some ways what both of you have provided are very different stories of what, let's call it gigification, looks like in our contemporary moment in two countries, India and China, who in some ways are dealing with similar global neoliberal environments, but you know, the, as you point out, the prehistories are very different, the gendered aspects are very different, how the political economy plays out on the ground at national and regional and local turfs tend to be very different. Um, what the global, the relevant global systems and structures are, whether it be IP laws in one case and software industries, or whether it be, you know, supply chains of Apple um, are very different. And yet there are all sorts of interesting parallels in these stories of geekification that both of you talk about. So I wonder if the kind of, you know, final um, points that both of you could talk about is this kind of comparative note of how your story seems different or alike from um, the other story. But Lily, first, maybe on Jugar and local pushback. Um, yeah, so my answer to this one actually might be pretty short. Um, you know, my field work was limited in that, you know, I primarily was embedded with middle class um, professionals kind of in, in the English speaking social worlds. So the, there was, there is a, vibrant discourse of kind of using Jugad as a valorized term in um, in the kinds of arenas of like art production or business schools. So there's a book called Jugad Economics. Um, there's been museum exhibitions about Jugad as a form of, you know, global South innovation. Um, I think in terms of my concerns, which are grounded, I think fundamentally in labor and hierarchies of value among different kinds of workers in a kind of political economy, but at this, you know, understanding at the subjective micro sociological level. I think in terms of my concerns, like the kinds of celebrations of attempts to celebrate Jugad that I've observed are, um, they, they still, you know, the, there's, I don't know that they really matter for the people at the levels of, you know, like village, you know, rural producers that I've kind of focused on in my talk. They kind of live in business schools and art museums and seem like different middle classes or sectors of industry competing with one another to have a legitimating discourse for their own particular forms of knowledge and production that they bring to the table. Um, but that doesn't, and then I think like the the devalorization of Jugad. A lot of what I've seen happens in the kind of Bollywood or English language media in ways that seem like they're very like middle class positionalities that are critiquing what Jugad means for development. So I'm not, um, yeah, in the brief times that I've been in the village, like following the designers around, like it's not something that came up. But I also, someone else might have done the field work where they might know better the answer to your question in different social strata. 
and um, yeah, that's that's the question that was posed. I know that doesn't deal with the gigification, but um, I can come back to that maybe if you want to ask. Is there a question for Ige, or should we conclude with talking through? The I mean, there are many questions. We are yeah. also out of time. So, do you want to just take a minute, Lily, to just make final comments, and then maybe Ige, and then we wrap it up. But... Um, Ige, can I ask you to go first, actually, for the gigification? Because like I usually think about that in terms of my other projects, and so I just need time to connect. Sure. I'll be very, very brief because, um, you know, we don't have time and also it's a profound question. I think, first of all, I think having this event to put in the comparative perspective from the global south is super, super, super important, as I mentioned, right? In the past, when we questioned this uh, to look at this so-called novelty of this, right, uh, we compare it with this, you know, uh, mid-century for this the model of it, then we thought, wow, this is bizarre. But actually, right, in the third world, we've never been formalized that much, especially at my understanding in India, right? Uh, in social China, uh, some, what's of, uh, some level of formalization. So when we change our reference points, then maybe we're able to see a broader and longer global trend uh, there. So I think that's just one thing I want to point out, like how valuable our perspective is, um, yeah. I think for me, one way I think about gigification with in, in connection to this research that I presented is actually thinking about platformization. So if um, if when we talk about the making of platforms uh, that, that offer, you know, that putatively offer this kind of flexibility that expand the pool of people who can find markets or consumers for their work, um, you know, I've come to think of platforms as uh, high tech insertions into previously existing forms of labor relationships that change the mediators, change the gatekeepers and change like how, you know, policies for extracting, extracting rents or setting wages or controlling labor can be enforced through the technology. But um, there's actually a way in which the kind of innovation practices that state, um, that like that kind of, uh, that like was celebrated through entrepreneurship uh, was trying to produce like it, it's a, it is like another it's like it is an insertion like in the water filter project you have these like water storage practices that are done with the readily existing kind of technologies and material culture but you have this nonprofit and the manufacturers that wants to empower um to insert their quote properly designed products into the cycle of consumption as a way of generating money and so uh, I think for me, like the point about uh, gigification is also, you know, partly looking at the, the kinds of labor that the, the transformations to labor, I guess in my talk, maybe domestic labor that are implied by the inserted transformation that we might call gigification, but also to look at the um, media, the kinds of the design of the design of that transformation of those labor relations as something that exceeds platformization. Like it's about inserting, say, a corporation into domestic like social reproduction responsibilities. And how does that change acts of consumption or family relationships or village relationships? Um, that's a bit distant, but I mean, that's just yeah, how I think. No, actually, I, I, I think it's actually a very useful corrective, just like Ige's comment was about maybe even turning to these terms such as gigification puts us back in a comparative framework where the United States you know, becomes our frame of reference. Whereas as mm -hmm. you're pointing to the transformations of labor that are taking place have very different histories are taking place in very different ways. Um, and we need different kinds of terminology rather than just resorting to what has been drawn from this neoliberalization political economy literature of largely the US. So, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, so I do have to wrap this up. Um, but I do want to thank um, both Lily and Ige for these really rich presentations. Um, hopefully, this is the beginning of an ongoing set of conversations. Um, and also a real special thanks to my colleague Ying for her very thoughtful remarks. Um, I will not be 
able to close this without thanking um, the India-China team, including my co-director, Mark Fraser, um, um, the deputy director, Grace Howe, who always makes things work seamlessly, her team, and especially Anna V, who's really backed us up, um, and Michael Evans at IT. Um, and finally, a big thank you to all those in the audience who have Zoomed in from different parts of the world. Um, um, thank you for coming in and um, goodbye. Thank you all.